Good morning, and uh, <coughs> it's a privilege to be here today and to moderate this session. Uh, my name is Vicente Garrido. I have uh, been working for this university in the last 25 years as uh, uh, one of the person in charge of the uh, research uh, international projects, and, and I am a professor in international relations, and I serve as a uh, member of the advisory board for disarmament issues of the Secretary General of the United Nations. I am not a desperate at all of identity, but I will try uh, to do my best. <laughs> we have, it's a privilege having two experts today here in this session for uh, speaking um, about this uh, very uh, substantial and very attractive issue about identity after Brexit. Uh, both the two dimension, um, my suggestion especially for uh, having as much discussion as possible, we have two uh, identities issues regarding Brexit, a domestic one, political one, political identity, um, but also the very, very important implications um, for the European Union, Croatian, and the future of the uh, uh, project of the so-called European um, uh, uh, project and the future of the European Union. Um, we have two, two presentations now. Uh, the first one will be by Mr. Roland Tso from the Stratford University. Uh, we, have two, uh, the, 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 we have two very impressive curriculum that I will try to summarize by, by um, 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 stressing the most important uh, uh, professional and um, aspect of the curriculum um, is an uh, author and editor of, of, of multiple works on migration, social and political integration and ethnic identity. Today uh, the presentation will be about the uh, global Europe, rethinking migration, democracy and uh, what uh, sustains Europe and, uh, at home and abroad. We don't have to steal the presentation here. And um, he's uh, editor and author of, of many, many of several books, especially Agnid Europe, Mobility, Identity, and Conflict in a Globalized World, published by Stanford University Press, and Migration and Integration, New Models for Mobility and Coexistence, uh, published by the University of, of, of Vienna Press. Uh, um, he used also to deliver lectures um, on, on these uh, subjects at the universities in the United States, Europe, and Asia. And uh, he uh, used to also to collaborate with uh, Le Monde Diplomatique. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Tso is a research affiliate and former associate director of the Europe Center at the, the uh, Freeman um, the Spaulding Institute of in, uh, for International Studies, and he's also the director of uh, research um, of the uh, Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project at Stanford University. Previously, he served as associate director of the Introduction uh, to Humanities postdoctoral program and associate director of the Stanford uh, um, Humanities Center. Uh, he earned the uh, PhD at the University of Chicago and was assistant professor of history at the University of Idaho. So thank you, and I will introduce you later on. Um, I, um, um, my intention is uh, to be very uh, strict with the time in order to have as much uh, time for debate as possible. And a maximum, but um, maximum, really, you have not to, you don't need this, but of 30 minutes, uh, if you can do that in 28, it's better. <laughs> 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 because the two uh, minutes uh, left, I, uh, I will use this for the presentation of the next speaker. Thank you. <laughs> keep it short. <laughs> keep it short. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you all. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Um, I have to say, so this is my first visit to the COVAR, COVAR meeting, and I thank you for the invitation. And it's one of the warmest groups I've been part of. It's remarkable. Uh, and uh, far beyond the coffee and caffeine that's helping me combat uh, the jet lag, it's, it's really the intellectual stimulus of our conversation. So 
You will not hear the name René Girard in my talk. As I mentioned, I'm an imposter here at this group. I did not work with him. I, I knew him at the university, um, but I did not have the pleasure of working with him. Uh, nevertheless, the more I listen and learn from you, the more I hope that you will be hearing and seeing some areas of mapping uh, theory onto my presentation. Uh, as well as possibly some case study examples where it may run into problems. Um, so I was asked to talk about Europe, that is the European project as I take it, in this period after the vote in the UK to withdraw in some fashion from the European Union. And um, in looking at that project, that question, I have three sort of troubling areas that I want to address that I think may be on many of your minds. One is, why do leaders of the European project seem prone to electoral defeats? Uh, the so-called Brexit vote is not the first, and as I will argue with some case examples, won't be the last of a uh, summarily defeated existential vote on the nature of the European Union? Uh, is it that they have a perverse interest in uh, defeatism? Or uh, are they responding to an exigency that leaves them no choice but to pursue policies that are unpopular? Second sort of concern that I have is about the area of uh, immigration and refugees, which is a special interest of mine, resettlement of refugees. Uh, is Europe moving, the European project moving towards curbing uh, the inflow of uh, irregular so-called migrants, uh, especially as advertised in much media, or is it in fact pursuing policies that will accelerate the inflow of populations to the European continent? Uh, and third, when I'm curious about the future of Europe, I'm asking myself, and I wonder if it'll be of interest to you, to ask what's happening in Africa. And I'll get to that uh, in my talk. So my answer is, is the argument that EU leaders are demonstrably incapable of winning popular referenda. But they see a threat more dire than declining popular support. This is a threat that makes it imperative to proceed with a global role for Europe. In this morning's talk, I'll argue that the future of Europe is being determined by a convergence of policy and business strategy that's aimed to change the face of a working age Europe. And I approach what will sound like a purely international relations uh, set of materials from a humanist perspective. I break down the talk into uh, four sections. Um, so where is Europe headed? What are Europe's international <coughs> struggles? Uh, and that's sort of, that was meant to be part of where is Europe headed. Saving the European project, solutions from abroad, and what I call a convergence of policy and business leadership. In the first section, um, the future of Europe seems in doubt. The forces of populist, nationalist, and separatist movements seem destined to pull Europe apart. The so-called Brexit vote, an ensuing process of the UK's withdrawal from EU membership, can be seen as a continuation of a series of political movements across Europe that leverage for political gain what populist leaders see as anxiety over loss of national sovereignty and culture. I mentioned that uh, the vote for on Brexit is not the first and probably not the last of electoral defeats on the European project. Since World War II, the transatlantic alliance has shaped Europe by defining shared EU, US policy towards prosperity and security towards expanding global markets and membership in NATO. But in 2016, just last year, the Brexit vote and the election in the United States of the Trump administration seemed like triumphs for nationalist and nativist movements. 
on both sides of the Atlantic. In democratic elections, anti-Europe seems to have won the day. Just recently in May 2017, indeed, the French presidential vote brought to power a candidate from outside of the two political parties that had led France's role as a founding member of the Union. The complexity is that, in fact, the new French president, Macron, campaigned on a pro-Europe so-called platform, while he now plans to push through UK-style labor market reforms against the French unions that, given the choice, could not reject him in a second round of voting. Perhaps a more lasting legacy of the French election is that it was in particular the far-right National Front anti-EU party that for a second time in a few decades eliminated the Socialists and more recently the Gaullist party from the second round of the presidential election. In the second round, the National Front candidate attracted more than a third of the popular vote on a platform of banning immigrants and renegotiating EU membership with the leverage of threatening a Frexit of France's own. French presidential candidate Marine Le Pen, her popularity has endured. Her support remains and will likely continue to be strongest in departments along the Mediterranean and South Atlantic on a platform of anti-immigration and in the economically distressed North on a platform of anti-globalization, anti-EU. UK Prime Minister Theresa May, who came into power on the heels of the Brexit vote, we've seen that she calculated she would strengthen her party, her party base, by pivoting from cautious to full-throated support to pursuing UK's exit. Apparently, and I just was transiting through, UK, uh, through Heathrow Airport, so the papers are full of it, that she apparently badly miscalculated the vote, especially in terms of a higher-than-expected turnout among younger voters who see the EU as an opportunity for social mobility. Nevertheless, I'd argue that the UK Prime Minister is pinning her hopes of consolidated power by allowing rumors to circulate that she may negotiate for a UK quote-unquote hard exit with abrupt shocks to the European common free trade, labor, and immigration regimes. And I think this would affect all of us who are observers or are citizens of the European Union. German Chancellor Angela Merkel's recent party victory in 2017, while more comfortable than predicted, also demonstrated the liability among voters of her decision to make Germany a leading host for asylum seekers in Europe. This is my special focus. It's by these measures that we should say that the future of Europe should be in doubt. Uh, and I show here a slide that, um, like all good <coughs> visuals, I've cherry-picked the particular votes that demonstrate a declining trend. Uh, I basically bracketed it from the 1975 UK vote to join the European community to the UK vote to exit the European Union. The very far right uh, is a dramatic negative vote in Hungary over accepting immigration quotas uh, by the European Union, uh, but just meant to be a quick and rough um, uh, demonstration of the prevailing trend towards negative votes in popular referenda on European constitutional measures. Alongside the national elections, a pan-European anti-EU and anti-immigrant movement is gaining traction. The political movement named Europe of Nations and Freedom has emerged since 2015, bringing together such parties as France's National Front, Italy's Lega Nord, Belgium's Vlangs Belang, <coughs> Poland's Congress of the New Right, Austria's Freedom Party, and the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands. The stated goal of the ENF is to form a coalition of right-wing and far-right parties. The ENF also organizes a loosely knit group in the European Parliament. But perhaps most noteworthy, and this is from my perspective, these far-right parties are asking their domestic supporters of their nationalist campaigns to endorse their common European far-right platform. From where I sit, on the other side of the Atlantic, an observer, this seems to be a particularly European phenomenon, that these far-right parties, fueled by anti-European sentiment and rejecting the European project meant to overcome national difference, in fact rely on a robust EU 
in order to leverage anti-EU sentiment to overcome their own national differences. They are, in effect, as I see it, striving to create a pan-European position against Europe. It's ironic, but it's potentially potent. The target of the Europe of Nations and Freedom Party are the EU's Schengen Accord, allowing free passage between participating member states, the presence of Islam on the European continent, and the Brussels-based EU bureaucrats leading Europe into global markets and foreign intervention. In this view, the cause of these maladies is that national governments have not confronted Brussels. The solution would be to dismantle the European project and rejuvenate sovereign nations to close their borders and retreat from global business and foreign policy ambitions. But the time when nationalist and separatist movements seem most ascendant and the EU seems to be the toxic, toxic subject for plebiscites, what I see is the European Union expanding its role as a global actor. The referendums and threats to withdraw are actually spurring member states to buttress the European project. From its historical roots, that project prizes freedom from war on the continent and prosperity through free movement of trade and social capital. This morning, I'll argue that the European project is accelerated by defeats in national referenda and that to understand this apparently counterintuitive process, the area most in need of analysis is the European Union's ambition to use foreign policy as a means to achieve its prosperity. What propels European leaders to respond apparently dismissively to popular negative votes? The project's twin founding aims of security and prosperity are threatened, not so much by Euroscepticism or even negative constitutional votes, but rather by the sclerotic society that populist movements seek to protect. Behind current negotiations to manage the UK's exit, and especially to understand the hard line that the European Commission is taking towards the UK even before and certainly after the recent vote uh, that uh, um, diminished Theresa May's uh, majority, we can study an underlying anxiety over European demographic trends. European member states are showing long-term trends towards a declining workforce. The trend is towards a population that will not sustain projected demand for labor and productivity as well as standards of living and welfare in Europe's post-industrial economy. All the member states have access to data that I was able to call for this project. This data projects a need for additional labor in the foreseeable future. The European Union faces low birth rates, longer expected lifespans, and a large post-war quote-unquote baby boom generation born in the 50s and 60s, and now in their 50s and 60s, that's approaching retirement. Population statistics project that the European population will grow moderately until around 2020, level off until 2030, and then become notably older through the year 2050. When the current generation of workers moves into retirement and their children come of age, they'll make up a significantly smaller workforce. Through the year 2050, member states will face an increasingly acute labor shortage as well as severe problems financing their pension and social welfare budgets. The most widely used indicator of birth rates and projected population is the total fertility rate. A fertility rate of 2.1 births per woman is considered to be a replacement level in developed countries such as the member states of Europe. This would be the average number of births required to keep the population size constant constant in the absence of inflow migration. By comparison, a fertility rate of 1.3 is referred to by those who know much more about this than I do as the lowest low fertility and likely to cause a crisis, uh, and likely to cause a crisis. In the years 2014 and 2015, the fertility rate in the EU was 1.58. In 2015, France recorded the highest fertility rate on the continent of 1.96, with the lowest in the EU recorded by Portugal, Greece, and Spain at 1.3. That's that lowest of low. Currently, nearly all member states report a fertility rate barely above the 1.3 minimum. This is called from, straight from Eurostat statistics. According to Eurostat figures, 
the declining birth rate will be producing an aging population. So what we have here is a, suppose a, a classic uh, population pyramid that essentially shows uh, population by age groups. The, the horizontal bars are by different um, sections of, of ages. And the outline in uh, the, the, the shape in outline that sort of has a bulge lower towards the 40s is uh, from uh, 2015. And the bolded colored in figure is the projected 2080 uh, age population distribution of Europe. And you can see a dramatic um, uh, shift towards um, the older population. Again, coming straight from Eurostat numbers. Economic, de economic demographers refer to this as an impending pension crisis. In 2016, 24% of Europe's population was over the age of 60. By 2050, 34% are projected to be over the age of 60. Spain and Italy are singled out in reports that by 2050, they face having more than one in three citizens over retirement age. The EU Commission is responding to its member states' demographic trends and a geopolitical climate filled with risk. With some variation, policy and private sector leaders among member states react to a combination of the EU financial and economic crises, the devalued euro, security issues, terrorist attacks, and the strength of populist and far-right national movements, even climate change, as indicators that Europe cannot isolate itself and also grow its prosperity. After World War II, and especially since 1989, Eastern Europe has been a source of labor migration in Western, westward flow. However, moving forward, current and projected trends illustrate that this will not be sufficient to fill the EU's needs. The main quote-unquote sending countries of Europe's pre-1989 East, Poland, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia are in their new configurations, and they're experiencing, along with their Western counterparts, declining fertility rates. Even countries such as Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine, and Russia, all sources of labor migration to the EU after 1990 because of continuing per capita income difference compared to the EU, cannot be expected to fill the demand for European labor. Uh, and next is a slide that my staff prepared that I can't claim credit for, but is really kind of cool. Uh, so what I'm trying to graphically demonstrate is the perspective from the European Commission's point of view of the world. Uh, first from Paris, which I work on, looking towards the east to Warsaw, and now shifting to a new direction, which I'll discuss. So just a little visual distraction. After the turn of the millennium, the European search for solutions has been redirected from east to south. In view of the demographic decline, the European Commission raised the profile of its work on a Europe-Africa relationship. The Commission's policy communique, finalized after the Europe-Africa Summit in Tripoli in 2010, described, quote unquote, a partnership for democracy and shared prosperity with the southern Mediterranean. At the time of its release in 2011, there was already great concern about irregular migration, as it's termed, from Africa to Europe across the Mediterranean. But most member states reacted by holding directly affected states, principally Italy, responsible for humanitarian assistance. In this vision of this partnership, Europe's Foreign Office advocated pressing for sweeping reforms of public institution in North Africa. EU advocacy and intervention strategy has been based on a historical script of the transformation of Europe's east as a model for the Mediterranean basin's south. According to this model, the influence of Europe as a quote-unquote partner with the southern Mediterranean was to press for three areas of reform, democratic transformation and institution building, a quote, stronger partnership with the people and civil society, and economic development prioritizing small and medium-sized enterprises, youth vocational training, and healthcare in poor regions. regions. Following the 2011 communique, between 2011 and 2016, the EU Foreign Office and member states witnessed the early movements of what came to be known as the Arab Spring, or the Arab Awakening. 
Viewing the popular movements and democratic transition in Tunisia and Algeria, along with struggling to read signals from Libya and Egypt, the EU took cautious steps to respond with pledges of humanitarian assistance, election monitors, and training for promoting civil society initiatives. A much larger public profile was given to the rollout of the EU's militarized naval blockade, coordinated by its border agency Frontex, aimed at intercepting human trafficking on the high seas of the Mediterranean. Spain, France, Italy, and Greece, on behalf of the EU member states as far north as Sweden and Denmark, as well as the UK and Balkan nations have pressed North African governments to create a holding camp, create holding camps along <coughs> the southern Mediterranean coast. The strategy has added preemptive military component to humanitarian intervention. European border patrol ships now intervene on the high seas of the Mediterranean to deploy, destroy smugglers' boats and return migrants to points of origin. Throughout this militarized campaign up to 2016, the Commission nevertheless persisted to describe its goal of creating in what, what it calls its southern neighborhood an enlarged region of democratic political culture, compatible civil society, and a system of free movements of trade and labor in what was to become Europe's Mediterranean Union. By 2017 this year, however, the EU and most member states have narrowed their focus on Africa to the political expediency to stop the irregular transiting of migrants across the Mediterranean. In North Africa, the unfolding events of the Arab Spring presented to Europe a more complex process that included convulsive political movements and repression in Egypt, and above all, the collapse of the rule of law and ensuing power vacuum in Libya. For the EU, the instability among the main sending countries in North Africa has come to mean the end of political viability of speaking of the Greater Mediterranean Union. Leading up to the upcoming fourth Africa-Europe summit in November this year, the European Commission has released in May 2017 its report on EU-Africa relations. In order to generate the materials to substantiate its position towards Africa, the report includes a significant survey of leadership among members of governments of European member states, European private sector, business, private sector business and think tanks, and African Union counterparts. The EU findings highlight two views of Africa from across the Mediterranean. First, in terms of Europe's, Afri uh, Europe's view of Africa's strength, the EU delegation to the Europe-Africa Summit has pre-released its survey purporting that respondents from governments and the private sector on both sides of the Mediterranean nearly uniformly anticipate that most of the growth and benefit from a trans-Mediterranean relationship will derive from private investment. And there's a lot of detail in the slide we could talk about if you're interested. Towards this end, while EU aid would help build educational institutions, the main investment in the next decade will come from the European private business sector to develop African small and medium-sized enterprises. European large capitalized employers would invest in offshore African subsidiaries to supply a growing African consumer market and rejuvenate the productivity of the European manufacturing sector. And if this sounds like client states, I think it should. In this context, it may not come as a surprise that European businesses prioritize establishing a Mediterranean free trade region while African participants don't feel that they are in an, on an equal footing to enter into such a partnership. In terms of challenges or areas of concern, the EU survey reveals that European private sector respondents, along with their African counterparts, prioritize European investment in infrastructure, public utilities for stable energy and the like. Political leaders of the member states do not share these priorities. In this survey, they've gone on record ahead of the EU-African Union, Union Summit, asserting that their African counterparts should do more on their own to reform governments, civil society institutions, and security. Turning to Europe's largest expenditure in Africa, while the periodic Europe-Africa summits provide a public stage for government and private sector delegates to pledge to develop the economy of the greater Mediterranean region, the EU has a longer history of military engagement. 
Especially in the past decade, the EU has committed extensive political capital to sustain the commitment of individual member states to respond to security crises on the African continent. These crises of jihadist fighting forces, failed states, flows of displaced migrants and refugees have now interconnected North Africa with West and Sub-Saharan Africa. I reflect here on an interview that I conducted with the EU Foreign Minister at the time, Catherine Ashton, who first held the position of the very lengthy title of High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. I interviewed her at an important moment in Europe defining its global role. In the summit, summer of 2014, the European Union sent French forces to Mali. That mission, dubbed Operation Serval, or Di Desert Wildcat, which was announced by then President, French President Hollande and the EU Foreign Minister Ashton to combat an Islamic insurgency in northern Mali. So expanding our geographic view, Since that campaign in Mali, French forces have not left the continent. In fact, up through the last few months, has enlarged its campaign. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll wrap up here to make sure we have time for your talk. These, these couple of slides basically demonstrate uh, the, uh, the two things. One, I just want to show a couple of patterns here. So this slide is of uh, displacement of populations and the movements of refugees in uh, um, sub-Saharan to North Africa. Basically, see this sweeping, uh, pop the, the darker lines are larger population movements. And um, we tried to map the two, but they were just illegible. So the second um, map is to show the pattern of um, um, uh, EU military missions, they, they map quite closely. Uh, and the point here is that um, the East EU missions have stated aims to reduce migration from Africa by assisting African states to defeat terrorist threats. <coughs> the EU summits with Africa are then meant to shape African governments, societies, and, co and economies into partnerships that would create the conditions of order and affect client states for European offshore manufacturing as well as regulated African labor migration to Europe. A new way to see this, though, I would argue, is a process that the EU is pressing its member states to commit to containing political violence in Africa. And in doing so, these missions are part of the condition that compels the migration that European populist parties find most alarming. In the longer term, to the extent that the EU-funded missions directly and through local institutions create more stable rule of law, more robust economies and development, we see migration out of Africa driven by increased capacities and aspirations to migrate. Okay. Okay, thank you. So in conclusion, uh, and I'll skip the point here. Europe's future, our question was, what's the future of Europe? In terms of the court of popular opinion, Europe in the era of Brexit faces the likelihood of additional domestic referendum and defeat. Based on current trends and strategy to promote immigration, I think we can now say that the EU has shaped a condition of a deficit of democracy. The European Commission and member states are in a politically awkward position to answer populist criticism. We have seen that for the member states, their best case is to say that their own citizens are unable to sustain their standard of living, and the imperative is to invite emigration. They seem unable to make their case and will likely continue to lose their domestic contest for political favor. In this context, with the purpose of winning referendums, military and civil society missions in Africa with the resulting dislocations <coughs> and flows of refugees would seem to be a costly mistake. Inviting target immigration is an even greater incendiary move. In the number of member, European member states, especially the far-right parties, are being handed their best argument. To the extent that the EU appeals to member states for support for Africa missions and immigration assimilation programs, it leaves the states vulnerable to the charge that they are inviting the Trojan horse 
to weaken fortress Europe from within. Otherwise, we will not have debate. <laughs> so um, I am using the stage. Your, your mic uh, microphone will be cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, we can do we can do that here. But I uh, I, I want to have really uh, at least 20 minutes for for debate. Well, um, thank you very much, also, and uh, we can now. We turn now to the second topic. I have realized you have already the curriculum in your folder and your in your documentation. So I will only uh, pick up a, f a couple of of of, of um, 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 bio um, information about Mr. Duncan uh, Morrow. Now he's a lecturer in politics in politics at the Eastern University. He has published uh, especially a lot, uh, a very very productive. Uh, production on, on the uh, in, in fields of conflict resolution, Northern Island politics, uh, which uh, will be the topic today, conflict resolution and Northern Island also, and the relationship between the religion and politics. And currently is the director of uh, community engagement at Ulster University, uh, research interest in conflict and religion, ethnic conflict, Northern Island politics, and the work of uh, René Girard, and um, a publication I will only pick up uh, uh, the, the, the last one, Reconciliation ap after uh, in Northern Ireland, the search for a political order in an et ethnically div divided society. For 10 years, uh, Mr. Duncan has been the uh, chief executive of the Northern I Ireland Community Relations Council, and he has also served as chair of the Scottish Government Advisory Group of um, uh, taking um, sectorism and, and in, 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 uh, in, in, in 2016 he was also was a chair of the Scottish Government Advisory Group of taking aid crime preju uh, prejudice and community question. Thank you. Um, please uh, you will get three uh, communication of my five <laughs> minutes, one <laughs> minute and please time is time. Yep. Thank you. Indeed. Um, it always feels like that's your obituary when you're getting those long, long introductions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's hard to <laughs> overstate how pleased I am to be here, actually. Um, I am, I suppose, uh, a substitute here, but to be in the midst of people working with, through, for, against, I think, of René Girard is always a privilege, so I'm really honoured by the invitation. I am going to take a slightly different approach to the question of identity in Europe. Um, after that, in, that kind of masterful overview of some of the contexts we're in, uh, trying to look at the work of René and Paul Dumachel particularly in dealing with some of these questions of identity. Um, but I always have to say I rely on my own experience for this. Um, I live and work in Northern Ireland, the failed frontier of the British state in Europe. In a deep sense, we have never known the monopoly of violence and have lived in a postponed state of violence, as Paul de Michel calls it, for all of my life. Identity in institutions in the state, in nations, has always been insecure where I live, uncertain and potentially violent, shaping public life and relationships in every aspect. For half my career, I have been an academic, teaching politics, and for the other half, I've been an activist, including 10 years, as was introduced there, for the main umbrella, working for the main umbrella body designed to support community-based initiatives towards reconciliation uh, in Northern Ireland. In both cases, making sense of the endemic hopelessness of our circumstances and finding ways to move forward has been the centre of attention. Living in Northern Ireland, I have necessarily experienced Brexit from both inside and outside. In 1998, the Good Friday Agreement signed by the British and Irish governments with international support sought to remove political rivalry over the constitution by creating equality beyond national citizenship. Every person born in Northern Ireland has the right to be British, Irish, or both. So Brexit, I am both in and out. <laughs> Precisely because Northern Ireland lies in a tectonic plate of nationalist antagonism, the idea of Europe as a supranational overarching authority and territory within which to find solidarity beyond antagonism has been important. 
It's a seamlessness and territorial continuity of the European Union no longer exist for us, and instead we find ourselves straddling the only land frontier of the UK-less EU with the UK. I spent most of my adult life in the orbit of the thinking of René Girard. My parents were committed members of a small, intentional Christian ecumenical community, Protestant and Catholic, seeking open relationship in the middle of Northern Ireland's conflicts. Even before the outbreak of violence in 1969, the community was concerned with reconciliation community, a concern that took on an urgency and relevance which defined its existence for three decades. Girard came to us in the form of three Dutch men, Andrew Lascaris being one of them at this meeting being buried today, Rule Captain, who was my personal mentor, and Art van Rijn, who was there for a while and left. But they introduced us to Mimus and scapegoating. We were not, we were reminded, good people. In Mimesis, the question is never about our identity, but in whom does our identity lie? The radical question which Jesus poses is the question answered by Abraham and Moses, not who are we, but whose are we? The children of the city of God, or the God of the wandering faithful pilgrim? The children of Pharaoh, or the children of a voice from a bush, who is? The children of our father who was a liar and the murderer from the beginning, or the children of a God who's beyond death. In my Mises is never a question of, is there a God, but who is our God? A question of idolatry, not atheism, and of who we follow, and on that depends our identity. As Paul or Luther might have had it, only our faithfulness speaks for us, not our goodness, because any goodness we do inevitably and is always given to us in a mimetic relationship with another. So we were told, stop trying to be important and start trying to be faithful. I'll try to use these perspectives today. Paul de Michel notes that the two fundamental pillars of the modern political order have been the modern state, holder of the monopoly of legitimate violence and European colonial expansion. By establishing a monopoly of violence at home and a clear distinction between inside and outside, the European state fostered both internal solidarity and the beginnings of citizen equality. Within their territorial boundaries, where sovereigns could assert a monopoly of legitimate violence and exclude clashes between friends and foes, politics evolved as a discourse about citizen equality and social justice. Justice itself was characterised as a discussion of rationality, of values, of principles. Traditional obligations of traditional solidarity gave way to a kind of indifference on individuals, with social relations mediated through law and the state. Du Michel attributes some of this to the workings of Christianity and its instincts for the victims of violence over against the bonds of traditional ethnic solidarity. Critically, however, he says that the possibility of reason actually depended on the monopoly of violence within a territory and on the boundaries between the interior and exterior of the state. To quote Du Michel, the friendship among citizens is inseparable from the presence of an enemy which everyone fears. Internal rivalry is held in check by external threat. Reason emerges in the context of the elimination of threat through rigorous enforcement of external difference. Until 1914 at least, war between states in Europe was limited because competition was largely fought out in the colonies. In that space, European powers could give free rein to violence that was unencumbered neither by the rule of war nor respect to international law. Outside the metropolitan centre, the distinction between law and violence was asserted by what Carl Schmitt called the state of exception, eliding the legal with the non-legal. As Hannah Arendt observed, the boundary between force and violence evaporated in the imperial space into lawlessness. By projecting the rivalry outwards, the rivalry at the core was contained. Frank Wright, a friend of mine and a keen theorist of ethnic conflict in Northern Ireland, observed, however, that imperialism it wasn't the same everywhere. The greater the distance between the metropolis and its colonies, the stronger the boundary between the rule of law and colonial exceptionalism. Where the monopoly of violence faltered in territory contiguous to or close to the metropolis, the result was an uneasy coexistence. Here the state faced what Wright calls an assimilation crisis. Some people in, some people out. Wright identified those throughout the Habsburg and Ottoman empires and on the edge of the German and Russian empires. Where the assimilation crisis was most stark, the state faced rival claims to statehood in the form of popular nationalism. After World War I, all of this came to a head. 
The crisis was most irresolvable, however, when citizens and anti-citizens shared territory, preventing any possibility of the monopoly of violence. Here there were no clear territorial boundaries dividing in from out and establishing a clear authority for the state monopoly of violence. Here neither tradition nor majorities worked as a mechanism to establish any clarity about who, who was legitimate. Instead of uniform citizenship and a reasoned discourse about citizen equality and justice, all discourse was subject to the evident need to distinguish between friend and foe, between whom no equality was possible. Here the bounds of the internal group of solidarity not only held but were reinforced. Suspicion and inequality were, the, were at the heart of all processes of state. Equality between mortal enemies is neither desirable nor plausible if the primary requirement of justice is to have a preemptive violence over a rival terror. Once again, Paul de Michel describes the situation precisely. In so far as it is the other of violence, reason cannot exist except within the space pacified by the monopoly of legitimate violence. Outside of that territory from which foes have been excluded, reason recommends the same actions as violence. Yet theories of social justice hope to create on the basis of rationality a system of reciprocity from which no one is in principle excluded. Endemic mimetic rivalry for power demanded that politics distinguish between friend and foe. <coughs> violence or the threat of violence is simultaneously fa fascinating and polarizing. The rivalry increases increasingly erases all other internal differences, and especially where violence has already broken out, the internal creates the mil internal militarization of society. This is especially true of our relationship with the other, who is now only known through the mediation of rivalry and potential violence. The economy of revenge becomes an economy between groups, in which any individual can be held to be a legitimate target, transforming the individual perpetrator into a soldier for or hero for their own side and a criminal for the other side simultaneously. Relationships between individuals are increasingly conducted within the wider mimetic antagonism. Ultimately, groups have their collective identity vis-a-vis -vis an ideological singular them, which is simultaneously everywhere. Directing violence in the name of vigilance, deterrence and suspicion become the highest virtues of patriotism. This is no longer a question of Benedict Anderson's imagined community but a community of fate, bound together in rituals and myths, which, although they fail by definition to eliminate the other, binds all members of the community together, not only in an identity with one another, but against the other. Paradoxically, the shared enemy other has become the basis of our own identity and internal unity. Even worse, in practice, fragile internal barriers, bar balances can often be changed dramatically through the intervention of larger foreign powers. The scene is set for these disputed territories and their endemic rivalries to become the cauldrons of European great power rivalry, despite their apparently small status. One way to define fascism is that the friend-foe pattern of the frontier marches, the frontier marches, becomes the doctrine of state in resentful metropolises. If the, if the relationships of the frontier, which are normal where I live, become the relationships of the core, you get fascism. It is no accident that World War I was triggered by an event in Sarajevo and that the die for World War II was cast by his, Hitler's inexorable claims on the lost territories of Versailles. Sarajevo and the Sudetenland may be small, but they were the, cent but they were the central nexus of territorial uh, rivalry in Europe. For me, Girard is too French in his focus on Franco-German rivalry and battling to the end. <coughs> in a sense, his description of the post-war rapprochement of Adenauer and de Gaulle, crucial as it was, and even of Verdun, is to miss the main story, which took place further east. To be clear, he, like Dumouchel, acknowledges the post-war Western Europe emerged only because of the preeminent threat of the Cold War. But the Cold War also enabled the elimination of the apocalyptic history of East Central Europe, as laid out by Timothy Snyder, and the death factories, ethnic cleansing, and ideological warfare that underpinned it. In a sense, Western Europe was only possible while Eastern Europe was sacrificed to Stalin. Instead of European identity arising dazed from the apocalypse, post-war European identity was founded on an unlikely and undeserved resurrection. Europe, now defined as the area under the Marshall Plan, emerged in opposition to the Soviet Union and to some extent to make differences to the United States. To some extent, by excluding the killing fields of the East, the post-war European settlement was, in Girardian's terms, reconciliation postponed. <coughs>
within the isotropic territory of Western Europe, a series of what isotropic, that means continuous nations with almost no territorial claims or states of exception between them, established what they took to be a new normal, social and Christian democracy and human rights, all of which took their ethical cues from Judeo-Christianity while marginalizing the church. Ethics was the rationality of right thinking of good people, not the radical choice of reconciliation between reconciliation or unlimited violence, which could so easily have been the question after 1945. I am very sensitive to these frontiers, these places where monopoly of violence is not established and political discourse is characterized by endemic and es escalating rivalry because I was born and live in one. Already by 1914 uh, in Ireland, the state's monopoly of violence was rapidly crumbling. After World War I, it disappeared altogether in a frenzy of violent claim and counterclaim. Northern Ireland was rooted in the claim to monopoly of power and legitimacy by empire loyalists, but they had to try to assert their monopoly in the face of a radically and violently hostile minority who knew they could be transformed into a majority if only they could erase the border imposed on them by the United Kingdom. Our crucial difference is that the creation of Northern Ireland reduced rather than increased external interest in our rivalry. Instead of becoming the field of national mimetic competition, as in the defeated empires of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, Northern Ireland functioned as a kind of convenient mechanism forget of, for forgetting, a kind of cupboard to put your history into. Rivalry in Ireland, once a threat to the fabric of the British Empire, was confined to the outer reaches of the Northwest Atlantic and mad religious extremism in the north of Ireland. Furthermore, when the internal rivalry of Northern Ireland radically escalated in the 1960s, both Britain and Ireland sought ways to get off the escalator and began to act as moderating influences. Ultimately, this evolved into a unique interstate model of cooperation. By acting together, Britain and Ireland established an overwhelming force in favour of an end to violence, even if they couldn't enforce it entirely. Britain, British and Irish became the antidote to British or Irish. In this, a common cultural affinity with the United States and, most importantly, common membership of the European Union and acceptance of international law, particularly human rights, created at least the fragile beginnings of a coherent core. The course of what we know as the peace process, which has lasted longer than most people care to remember, illustrates Du Michel's point that both peace and war have changed now. They are not events. I, would talk at, I could talk at length and will talk at length eventually about this, but here I want to confine myself, what I say, to the question of identity and the escalation to the extremes. First of all, and unusually, peace was framed in our case explicitly as a question of reconciliation. The opening three paragraphs of the Good Friday Agreement are worth listening to in this regard. We, the participants in the multi-party negotiations, believe that the agreement we have negotiated offers a truly historic opportunity for a new beginning. The tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable leg legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or been injured and their families. But we can honour them through at best through a fresh start in which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust, and to the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. We are committed to partnership, equality, and mutual respect as the basis of relationships within Northern Ireland, between uh, North and South, and between these islands. Most dramatically, the two states, historic rivals of deep lo and long-standing, sought to unpick their rivalry over identity and citizenship in Northern Ireland by reform reformulating citizenship obligations in, in my view, unique way. Citizens of Britain and Ireland in Northern Ireland were no longer to be treated as rivals, but as partners. As Du Michel writes, and this is how radical, the radical background to this, the modern state is the institution thanks to which the fiction of equality has become real to a certain degree, but only within given borders and only for those who have, have a certain special relationship of belonging to the territory. Membership is above all expressed through a special relationship, citizenship. <coughs> 
but now the rights of citizens were not to be dependent on citizenship of a particular state. The Good Friday Agreement, possible only under the European Union, is revolutionary when it declares the birthright, as I'm quoting, of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may choose, and accordingly confirm that their right to hold both British and Irish citizenship is accepted by both governments and would not be affected by any future change in the status of Northern Ireland. Instead of treating Northern Ireland as a site for escalating rivalry, Britain and Ireland simply removed citizenship from rival by embracing the citizens, their, their duties to the citizens of one another. Almost certainly this was only possible because of the changes in their own relationship brought about within the European Union. Because sovereignty was no longer exercised over and against each other, identity, at least in theory, was no longer in stake, at stake. So, and here's what it says. Whatever choice is freely exercised by a majority of the people of Northern Ireland, the power of the sovereign government with jurisdiction there shall be exercised, exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all the peoples in the diversity of their identities and traditions and shall be founded on the principles of full respect and, and equality, of civil, political, social and cultural rights, of freedom from discrimination for all citizens and of parity of esteem and of just and equal treatment for the identity, ethos and aspirations of both communities. In practice, however, and finally, the history of Northern Ireland since 1998 has highlighted the enormous power of mimetic rivalry to continue in spite of stated intentions. If I had time, I would examine this, but I can only make a few remarks here. First, while the concept of reconciliation was formally acknowledged, it became clear that its demands went beyond the political. As Girard comments in Battling to the End, violence and reconciliations are questions at the level of the anthropological rather than the political. In this, we should not treat them as the same as politics. The mimetic shift from violence to reconciliation is not a Hegelian agreement at the end of a struggle in history, but a question of desistance from mimetic rivalry, which has escalated to the extremes. Northern Ireland provides profound evidence that rationality assumed in political treaties and legal frameworks can, can, only, part, can only point to what is required. The refusal not only of violence, but of the mimetic rivalry that underpins violence. Without which, the potential for escalation to the extreme, to extremes in the manner which Girard describe it, describes it and the Chevy Clausewitz seems to me to continue. Specifically, it is clear from our experience that two aspects at the heart of Girardian concern have the capacity to immediately trigger this escalation. The question of violence, particularly the question of recognizing, recognizing our own contribution to violence in the past, and, how we've, and, that, and the question of how we forgive, in the most profoundly biblical sense, our new partners for their violence. And the secondly, the question of identity. It is clear that we, the most profound challenge to reconciliation after violence is that we no longer know who we are. Having defined ourselves vis-a-vis -vis one another, over against one another, the ending of violence is an experience of extreme disorientation and internal uncertainty. The loosening of the internal solidarity of identity rivalries results in unexpected internal incoherence. Reconciliation, an open rep relationship in place of a hostile other, turned out to be a frightening place. Without an identity in something else, an identity which can only be found in the face of a common acknowledgement of something like our human weakness, the attraction of antagonistic identity remains and the potential for it to reassert itself is, is, is considerable. Okay, so, I will simply say this, that um, I've labored this question not because I want to rest on a single insignificant case study, but for, because for me it surfaces the nature of identity and rivalry, the way in which identity is shaped in relationships, and the way in which dialectics of mimesis reflect precisely the shape accorded to them by Girard in Battling to the End. Practically, they also very specifically suggest the limits of politics to resolving a crisis of identity in the manner also identified. A crisis which is understood in terms of identity, but where change is only possible at the level of mimetic relationships. Reconciliation is not rational peace building, but a radical transformation of our relationships. In the face of the risk of escalation to the extremes, il faut refuser la violence. <laughs>
If I turn finally to the topic of this presentation of identity in Europe after Brexit, I do so because it is already evident both the background of Brexit and the already visible consequences of Brexit, which are expressed in crises of identity, can only be understood as mimetic crises. I will limit myself again to just a few things. The general crisis in Europe, for me, is underpinned by dramatic shift in the context of Western European sensibility. We're finally catching up with where we actually are. First, as Du Michel points out, Western Europe lost its external other at the end of the Cold War. The unifying effect of a territorial other was lost, amplified by rapid marketization and globalization. Secondly, the balance of power that had enabled Franco-German rapprochement was altered with unpredictable effects, not only in France and Germany. Suddenly, the echoes of war occurred, returned. Thirdly, the rivalries of power embedded and constrained on the edges of the Russian Empire and in Yugoslavia escalated more dramatically than almost anyone had predicted into almost apocalyptic violence in the context of Bosnia. And finally, the question of the identity of Europe, constrained and hidden by the Cold War in the West, could not now be avoided. But to extend the European Union to include countries traumatized by 1945, let alone 1989, was to extend from the security of states with a shared set of expectations in both politics, law and economics, to one in which there was no protected experience of social justice, citizenship and the monopoly of violence. Second point. The United Kingdom Ireland, and Ireland have a very specific history with each other and with the EU in general. Yep. Um, okay, I'm going to have to push this in. Um, one minute. You yeah. thought you'd give me ten. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Of course. Um, so br British relationships with the European Union are, are are very unique. I also want to say that um, the the experience of the last ten years then triggers these things with the with the refugee crisis, the globalisation crisis, and the euro crisis, but also with the war on terror. The and then I want to say something just about Brexit, uh, and then I want to just uh, conclude. The Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom was intended by its divisors in the Conservative Party as a democratic ritual mechanism for the re-establishment of the identity of the state in, re in relation to European affairs, posed as an apparently rational choice of a defined electorate in relation to equally attainable objectives. It was in practice precisely the opposite. The debate was conducted as a frenzied trading of lies, exaggerations, fears and resentments. Instead of establishing national solidarity, it blew open the question of British identity in a way that was probably even more dramatic than anticipated. Not only did it expose the extremity of rivalry between globalised winner, globalisation's winners and losers, but it opened up the chasm of difference between universities and non-universities, between those over 60 and those under 40, and between the various territorial parts of the United Kingdom, specifically England and its dissident provinces in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Furthermore, it did so on the inconclusive basis of a 52 to 48 per cent. Instead of resolving tensions, the ritual had escalated them. The triumph of the British nationalists was one of the causes of the collapse of British identity. Events in the last months have only underlined the crisis and the almost tangible absence of any ability of politics to resolve it. I want to close with two things. The first in relation to Girard and his analysis of a crisis, and the second in relation to our possibilities for finding ways forward. We no longer have the territorial order, a uh, continuous isotropic space of which each part is external to the other. The extent of these secure spaces is not determined by international agreements, but by the relation of power between adversaries. That's what Dumichel says. I think we have to take secondly Girard's discovery that the path of dialectics is dictated by mimetic rivalry detected by Clausewitz in relation to war and set against Hegelian fa fantasies about Aufhebel. I don't share René's view that politics and political leadership have nothing to offer, but there is no security response which can provide meaningful answers to a, somebody driving a lorry into 80 revellers in Nice last summer or into a concert in Manchester this April. The question facing politics is not just how to respond to violence, but how to prevent mimetic frenzy triggered by violence to overwhelm all institutions and eventually all of humanity. Thirdly, for as long as we stay in the circle of violence and counter-violence, we can make no progress. It is one of the features of our mimetic nature that our fascination and imitation can take both negative and positive forms. In either case, it remains mimesis of desire. We have, as Girard says, to avoid at all costs thinking of war as a passage towards reconciliation. So where might we look for change? <coughs> 
Change from mimetic creatures means one thing only, change in our models. With whom and with and with what are we mimetic? As Girard says, there is no solution to mimetism aside from a good model. The central importance of the gospel is that we have an alternative way to go, to be, to identify. A scapegoat model who imitates his father in what the gospel describes as love, which Paul tells us we can recognize in patience, kindness, absence of envy, boasting or pride, a refusal to dishonor others or seek self-interest, a slowness to anger, and an absence of any memory of wrongs. Thank you. I must, I just really want to finish this bit. It was at these conferences that Norbert Lofink introduced me to the notion that the gospel works not by counterculture but by contrast culture. In the abrupt, abrupt, it is the abrupt shock of mimetic alterity that chains get its chance. The critical task in these days is not to win within the battle to the end, but to seek models who bring in different possibilities. Our predicament will no longer be resolved merely by political and legal manoeuvres, but only by finding different ways of relating. This is neither romantic optimism nor terminal pessimism. I don't wish to join René in a choice between pessimism or optimism, but to stay clear of the vortex. So, four ideas. Politicians, no, no, uh, uh, what sentences, four sentences. Four, okay, four sentences first. Politicians should, without question, seek to re-establish values and political priorities, which seek to maximize equality. Two, we should look for and place at the center not good people, but people acting in freedom. For me, at the moment, the best model is Pope Francis. We can no longer rely on political or religious institutions to build identity, but we must do it at community level, intentionally as part of habit. And thirdly, the faith communities might begin to explore the question of violence and their responsibility for it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Bob. Thank you. So I, I, I expect that after this presentation, you have the idea that Spain is not so undisciplinate. <laughs> 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 so, because, okay, we, I, I see two fingers raised. I open now the floor. I have also myself some reflection, but I am going to avoid this because I see four fingers ready. I uh, recommend you five, six. Okay, I close the, 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 the now the, because I will pick up these six um, interventions now. And the uh, please be brief, um, uh, two minutes if possible. Uh, each and then uh, the, each speaker will have five minutes because otherwise we have to conclude that uh, in, in 20 minutes so we don't have much time so uh, I recognize here yes uh, uh, can you introduce yourself very brief please right. uh, Paul Gifford um, and I would like to say first of all thank you to both Thank you to both speakers uh, who were strategically insightful in different ways. Uh, the gallop through each of them is trying because these are so important, these matters. In the second case, there is a remedy. Uh, it needed, of course, you had a unique blend from Duncan of precise, concrete experience of rivalrous and conflictual situations, which was rare, and that was blended, again, uniquely, singularly, with uh, Girardian theory, fully understood and cautiously applied. So that was really very unique indeed, but it lacked, obviously, in that time, illustration. Well, there is some remedy for that. There is a seminar now beginning in the next session where you can rethink through Duncan's insights slowly and reflectively with concrete examples. And that will be a solution. Thank you, Dejit. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bosco Corrales. I come from the Catholic University in Valencia. And I would like to thank you both for your fantastic presentations. They were really enlightening. My question is for Professor Su. Um, I've been working on the EU response to the refugee crisis, or so-called refugee crisis, from an ethical perspective um, uh, in the moral philosophy field. And uh, I find always a resistance that, uh, yeah, you say there is a moral and legal obligation to welcome them, but uh, we cannot. I mean, it's not possible. And if we cannot, we do not have a real uh, obligation. So my question is, uh, very briefly if you can, uh, what can we do? And insofar we can, what are our moral responsibilities with them? 
and Thank please you. allow me to take the third one. Yes, I recognize the colleague there. Yeah. Yes, we have six all together. Don't worry, we will pick up on the first round three questions, and then in the second, the, the rest. Yes, please go ahead. First of all, thank you very much for both of your presentations. Um, both of you have on some level mentioned the failure of sovereign power as an, an element in, in, the, in the European experience right now. Um, and Duncan, you closed by saying that part of the way forward is for communities, individual communities, to take up some of the responsibility for reconciliation where sovereign power and institutions have failed in that work. Um, I would like to interject here and ask whether or not there is, to, to both of you, whether or not there is some danger in the responsibilities of individual communities taking on this sort of work insofar as it can come to look something like what Giorgio Agamben has called the camp where individual communities without institutional affiliations yet seem to be trying to take on the vestiges of sovereign power, the rights to declare states of exception. And it, it's something very different from what we heard this morning about collective interdividuality. This looks something much more like communities emerging in a kind of rigid sameness which tries to resuscitate the sorts of power which are no longer available to us and are failing around us. So I'm wondering how either of you would see the camp mentality as contributing to, your, to the European crisis and how that might be avoided. Thank you. So going back to the... Um, well, to take that directly, I Part of the problem, of course, is that, uh, as you saw, I could have spoken as could <laughs> for hours and hours on this topic. So it was a little bit unclear at the end there. Um, I worked for the Scottish Government. It was one of the things on, on a very interesting programme uh, about um, hate crime. They called it hate crime, prejudice and community cohesion. And what became extreme, it was clear to me, I suppose, before we started, probably from a Girardian point of view, that most people look to the law to give them the answers when in fact the issues are how are we with each other, what is the cohesion. My view has become not that the camps should do this, but that the states, that states and possibly churches, and religious institutions, uh, but carefully there, need to, need to integrate the notion, a, a notion now, we do not know each other. <laughs> And that that needs to be almost part of habit of, uh, become part of, uh, for Europe to survive, it has to become part of the habit of our culture. <coughs> if we do not accompany legal citizenship and all of these kind of formal refugee rights into building communities which are actually got some human meaning, then it does become us and them. It really is friend and foe. It becomes large numbers of people we don't know living, but living differently from us beside us who we don't like, who don't speak the right language, and you do get camp mentality there. So I want to be really clear that when I said, I think, I think what I'm saying is, if politics is to respond to uh, this general crisis in any meaningful way, it has to develop new tools. And that looks like making the question of, and that may be in, uh, for young people, but it may not only be that, it may be also in, in communities and schools, is how do we build places where people meet in a way which allows the us and them not, precisely not, to emerge. And uh, that, but we can't leave it to accident anymore. We actually can't leave it to voluntary effort. It has to actually become part of citizenship in Europe now. If we're meaningfully saying all these people from Africa are coming here, I have to tell you, I, th that if, if all these people come from Africa as foes rather than friends, that will be a catastrophe. What we cannot do is invite people in here to be foes. What we have to invite people into is to be friends. And what that looks like in political terms, for me, must become now uh, a question. What does that look like? Um, so in Scotland, we were looking at uh, the potential, for example, for people who get attacked to go to places of safety. And, and, to be, and for those places of safety to indicate themselves. And we were looking, uh, one of the issues, for example, is people get attacked in spaces where there's no law, like buses. Um, so uh, what do, how do you help people who, are attack, who see an attack and don't know how to intervene? How do, they, how do they engage with someone of that nature? So, but beyond that, how do we grow up together and grow towards each other, and in what shape? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that development. And, and thinking about these questions, these three, and especially about refugees, um, 
one of the things I like about this group is the uh, I feel encouraged to think theoretically, creatively, and experimentally. And in this case, I'm reflecting on the two presentations from this earlier this morning. And what I see in the dilemma on the reception of refugees in Europe, in a sense, is a combination of the non-hegemonic or the sort of rethinking the hegemonic relationship and the emancipatory argument that we had in the two talks last time. That is, um, what I tried to illustrate in the mapping here is that the EU is part of the process of creating refugees. That in its intervention, just as the United States has intervened since the 1950s in Central America, the European Union as a global actor sees first it perhaps from a, a narrow point of view a strategic reason for intervening. It is displacing populations. These populations are moving to the north to Tripoli <coughs> and then are crossing the Mediterranean. Once they, in a sense, bite off as much as they can chew, they have to continue to finish the process. The U uh, European Union member states are also signatories to the UN Convention on Rights of Refugees. Uh, into that convention, they are required to provide minimal, uh, and it is quite minimal, processing of asylum applications. The next step is assimilation or uh, refugee resettlement projects. If you look at the numbers, Europe has been actually quite uh, uh, active in resettlement compared to the United States in per capita. Nevertheless, um, it's, it's a theoretically interesting argument to say instead, what can we do, what will we do with the refugees that we are creating? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I recognize uh, the, yes, the, the man at the back of the room. Yeah, last line. Then here on the corner, the second one, someone asks here, yeah, and then. Just a, a simple question. Um, first, again, thanks so much for the presentations. You seem to, um, Dr. Sue, kind of link the unpopularity of these um, policies with then a uh, kind of fear of, um, you know, a labor imbalance and a crisis based on an aging population, um, it seemed like the more obvious policy thing would just say to have more children. Um, has this been tried? Um, what, what would, you know, would that solve the problem? Uh, <coughs> Thank you. The, the gentleman here in the corner, yeah. Please, can you identify yourself very brief? Uh, yes, uh, Mark Anspach, and um, I want to quickly address a bit of the same issue as, as Grant. I really liked the, uh, the Dr. Shu's uh, presentation. I, I wanted to take issue with the European Commission's view on this demographic problem, because I think it's a very uh, ideologically biased view, and you get, did a good job of presenting that view. But the idea that if you have fewer children, that's economically unsustainable is not necessarily the case. I mean, it's a sign of prosperity when people have fewer children, and it's a sign of prosperity when people live longer, and therefore they're retired from the labor force longer. But if you simply say people are living longer, there are more old people to support, uh, that's going to cost more money, and we can't do it because there aren't enough children. What that is overlooking is that raising children costs money too. So the real comparison you have to make is between uh, how many people are participating in the labor force and earning money and paying for social spending, and how many people are not? And among the people who are not, you have children. So a, a young family that has two children and, and grandparents who are living longer, they're going to have to show out more for the grandparents, but they're going to have to show out less than if they had three or six children. If they had to have six children to tend the fields, that would be an economic reason for doing that. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, a very in, it's very incomplete and, and biased to simply uh, look at uh, uh, the, the, uh, the elderly as a, as a burden. And there's a risk, actually, of scapegoating, scapegoating the elderly. Second very quick point is there is, I think, another solution to the problem, which is that people, if people earn more, if people earn more, then they can contribute more to pension plans. But if you have free movement of capital and labor, and that keeps wages down, then, of course, 
that's going to be a problem for the pension system in the long run. And if you say, as the European Union does, and as Germany, uh, as, 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 as the German elite does today, because they talk about these issues very openly, you say the solution is to bring in uh, f uh, foreigners to do the jobs. Well, that's a solution which is bringing them in to preserve a system which keeps wages down. And it, what it comes down to, 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 to use the phrase that uh, Duncan used at the end, Thank you. If, you, if you invite them in to keep down the wages of European workers, then you're inviting them in as foes. And so it is normal that the European workers will rebel against that. So, thank, you. thank you. And the gentleman here in the first line, yeah. Last question, yeah. Yes, question. Can you identify yourself? Yes, I'm, I'm Ivan Blechi from, from, from Italy, University yeah. of Cagliari. And I wanted to ask you a clarification and a question, actually. Uh, because I remember, this is something I'm paraphrasing here, Girard, who said something uh, sometime, uh, once uh, in a sense that this idea of uh, good individual, bad institution is the primary myth. This is how he expresses it. It's the primary myth of our time. And he says that leads to a chronic and dangerous illusion of our own innocence. And I was wondering, and this is my, I, the impression I got from this Brexit event, and as you mentioned, 52, 48, so it was... That wasn't it basically a gigantic scapegoating uh, of an institution. G Gerard suggested, in, in effect, that we could use institutions and s that there's are something to be scapegoated. And I can fully understand the mechanism, because if you ask people to decide the outcomes of, uh, without tools, and even those who have tools do not have tools to decide what the effect will be. But what do you go? You go with the make magical thinking and conspiracy and go with scapegoating. Although, if you think about it, and it's very interesting, your case in, in the Northern Ireland, the way that, that you said that the European U Union offered the, uh, as a platform for solidarity, and I fully agree that that, that, so that kind of solidarity needs, is for it, needs institution. It can't just be a cultural exchange that we had through centuries among Europeans. It has to have institutions. So the question is, if you can scape, scape, scapegoat institutions, and isn't then European Union kind of, uh, among all the institutions, the, I'm going to be blasphemous here, the closest to figura Christi institution among the institutions. And my fear is here that maybe we are going to scapegoat European Union because we do not know what we are doing in a sense of institutions that are provided, and that are being, by the way, if you think about your, your, your intervention, is very interesting because it shows us that the institutions are better than individuals. You don't, you, we really don't understand how, how, what kind of a gigantic effort it takes to organize yeah, the mean, movement yeah. of, of <laughs> refugees and so on and so on. So if you think about it, and they're doing silently, so you know, uh, maybe this is kind of a, a clarification. I was Hi, to good morning, sir. Yes, 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 yes. We have to finish because we are already in time and we have, it's okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I hope I give some answers here. Um, I suppose um, this, to me, the, the fundamental issue of our time is that the friend foe distinction is no longer held at bay. It's 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 in at our door. It's at our door. And mimetic rivalry is rising all over around this basis. And I don't think it's going to change. I personally think I was right. This this is this is this will become the crisis of our time. And uh, the issue I go back to Lofink here is that the answers in the Girardian sense are never um, yes or no. There to stay out of that rivalry. There, what does it mean to, to, to offer something new in the world? And the Jesus model certainly doesn't say effectiveness in the first row is going to be the, the outcome. The, the Jesus model is absolutely is do what you have to do and then trust in the Lord kind of thing. Uh, but it's, it is essentially that effectiveness is not guaranteed. The crucifixion wasn't initially, didn't look too successful. Um, number one. Uh, number two, the uh, this scapegoating, scapegoating is, in my view, um, built in to politics because politics belongs to culture. So we, in a sense, are asked every time we elect to decide who to scapegoat. So we choose our scapegoats and we treat them relatively 
better or worse than in, in European countries. In the sense of, of international institutions becoming the, the target of nationalist particular scapegoating, I mean, Central Europe watched the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, which there were lots of reasons to not like. But the Habsburg Empire, uh, in retrospect, looks a lot better than some of the things that happened 20 years after it. <laughs> the, 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 so we may miss, well, well miss it, it like um, that Australian correspondent said about America. We may not like uh, Western leadership, but we miss, we miss it when it goes. We may miss the European Union when it goes. I am living in a space which is absolutely knows this. In Northern Ireland now, and this, let me just point a little small thing out to finish about <laughs> what one of the consequences of, of Brexit actually is. The only land border between the European Union and, uh, and U UK runs through Ireland. And every single electoral area, constituency, um, touching the border is run by a party called Sinn Féin who are radically anti-British. So the British have to impose their border and or the Irish have to impose their border at the absolute epicentre of Irish nationalism where they will not put up with borders. Neither the European Union nor UK will be able to enforce the border there. It is simply not tenable. As soon as the posts go up, even if they're electronic posts, they'll be blown up. There is no possibility that they will last more than a day. Uh, and the British Army spent years trying to get out of there. They went in there and they spent 30 years before they could get out. I can't see any appetite for that. The European Union doesn't actually have an army, and Ireland certainly doesn't have an army. So there will not be actually a functioning border in this place. This will become, so it's largely fictional. <laughs> but what will happen there is bandits.